Hey, this is Avi Gutman with another Ask Me Anything event brought to you by QuantReasoning.com. I invite you to join me live next time. We do this every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and you can attend for free by starting your free trial at QuantReasoning.com. I have a very important question for all of you. Do you think that perhaps you went to the statements too soon? So just give me a yes or no in the chat. If you think that in hindsight, yeah, maybe you should have spent a bit more time before going to the statements, give me a yes. And give me a no if you think, nope, you did all of the work that you could possibly do before going to the statements. Okay, so I'm seeing mostly yeses. And, and I think that that's a really important question to ask yourself when you're practicing at home. Don't wait for me to ask you that. When you're just on your own and you're looking at a brand new data sufficiency question, go with your habit, whatever that habit is. So, you know, try to solve it the way you normally would. But then ask yourself, in hindsight, was there more that I could have done before going to the statements? Because I think that's really the only way to improve substantially. I'm not talking about picking up a few points here and there. I'm talking about really, you know, revolutionizing your ability level on, the, on this test. It requires you to be open to changing your habits in a meaningful way. Okay, so let's see how I would walk through this question. They start by defining some kind of sequence. And in case you're not that familiar with, with this kind of notation, I'll, I'll just mention the following. This is the mathematical way to describe a sequence that goes on forever. They're saying here's a, the first term, second term, third term. Then there's a, some unknown number of terms. This is what we would call the nth term, whatever n, you know, so if n is 150, then that's the 150th term. But then we have another dot, dot, dot there after that. So if it wasn't for the dot, dot, dot at the end, then we would say, okay, this, this sequence has exactly n terms because it, it looks like the very last term is the nth term. The dot, dot, dot afterwards implies that, no, the nth term is just one more term among many, and as far as we can tell, this sequence goes on for infinity. And that's what we have here. It's an infinitely long sequence. And then they tell us that the nth term, so you know whatever n is, what is the nth term? It's 1 over n minus 1 over n plus 1. So, and then they say this is true for all integers starting from n equals 1. So I think that's where we take a long pause and we say, okay, what would the first term look like? Just to help me wrap my head around all that language. So I'm going to, for the very first term, I'm going to plug in n equals 1 because that's where the sequence starts. Okay, so if n is 1, I'm going to plug n equals 1 into that expression. So what does that look like? It would be 1 over 1 minus 1 over, and then in the denominator here I have n plus 1, but n is 1, so 1 plus 1, so 2. Okay, so that's the first term. And I would probably also figure out the second term, again, just to help me wrap my head around what's going on here. So the second term would be 1 over 2 minus one over three. Again, I'm just, this, this time I'm plugging in uh, n equals two into that same expression that they provided. So this is a second term. And I'm kind of seeing a pattern here, right? The, the next term, I don't need to write it down. I would just say that it's one third minus a quarter, and then a quarter minus one fifth, and then one fifth minus one sixth, etc. So I'm ready to keep reading. It says, if k is a positive integer, is the sum of the first k terms, so we're talking about the sum, of the first k terms, is that sum, I, I want to pause there. I guess I'd pause here after the word sequence. I want to pause again. And now for the first time, I'm wondering about what it would look like to add the first few terms of the sequence. What would that look like? So I mean, if I were to add, say, just these two terms, just the first two terms, what would that look like? Is there anything that I could take advantage of here? And what's jumping out at me is that uh, these two terms zero out. And I'm imagining, you know, if I, if I kept going, right, then what would happen next? These two terms would zero out. And so you, so you keep getting these terms that zero out, that cancel out with one another. 
okay, so in the end of the day, the sum would just be one minus, and for the minus, I guess it would depend on what is the last term. But they're telling me that they're talking about the first k terms, so the last term would be the kth term. But what does the kth term look like? Well, I would plug in k into that expression that they provided. So it would be 1 over k minus 1 over k plus 1. So the sum of the first k terms would be 1 minus 1 over k plus 1, because everything else in the middle there would just get cancelled out. And that's really the key insight that's required in order to solve this question. Now let's say I didn't I wasn't able to come to this insight. Right? This was just too hard for me. Well, then there would be no point in evaluating the statements anyway. At what point is there to try to evaluate the statements if I wasn't able to get here with my inferences? It would just be a waste of time. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier. I know that if I do a good job in the question stem, the statements will be very easy to evaluate. And if I get to the statements and they're not easy to evaluate, that means I didn't do a good job. And that's okay, because it's an adaptive test. So I will get questions that are too hard for me, and I need to be ready for that, and not to waste time on those questions. But this is a great way to realize that you need to guess and move on. I did the best work that I could possibly do in the question stem. I got to the statements and didn't really know how to proceed. Guess and move on. And that way you don't waste time. Okay, so they want to know, is that greater the 9 tenths. That's what the question is asking. Okay, under what circumstances would that be greater than 9 tenths? And that's, I think, that's hard for me to think about. That's hard, like, think about this. Under what circumstances would 1 minus 1 over k plus 1 be greater than 9 tenths? That's really hard for me to think about. But what's a lot easier for me to think about is under what circumstances it would be equal to 9 tenths. If the thing that we're subtracting, if that thing that we're subtracting was exactly one-tenth, then this expression would be exactly nine-tenths. Okay, so under what circumstances would that expression be more than nine-tenths? Well, it would be more than nine-tenths if the thing that we're subtracting is less than one-tenth. If you're subtracting less than one-tenth, if you're subtracting something smaller than that, then you'd be, right, so if less than that, then this whole thing would be greater than 9 tenths. So what this question is really asking is, is 1 over k plus 1 less than 1 tenth? And under what circumstances would this fraction be less than 1 tenth if the denominator is more than 10? And if you subtract 1 from each side, you get the finalized question, which is, is k greater than 9, question mark. And if you manage to get that far, then evaluating the statements is fairly easy because statement 1, of course, gives us a definitive yes. Anything that's more than 10 is, of course, more than 9. So knowing that it's more than 10 answers the question definitively, and we should eliminate the answer choices that claim that statement 1 is not sufficient on its own. And statement 2 tells us it's less than 19. So knowing that something is less than 19, are you able to tell which side of 9 it's on? Whether it's more or less than 9? No, we can't tell. Oh, we know it's less than 19. So the correct answer is A. N and K are both letters, so I can see why Nicole thinks that this is redundant. Why use two letters when you could just use one letter? They used N as a variable. So what is a variable? A variable is a letter that is able to take on many different values. So we can take on, we can say, okay, if n is 5, it would be this way. If n is 7, it would be that way. And they used n in this case to define the sequence. So they said for any value of n greater or equal to 1. That's, so right there, you know that n could be any integer greater or equal to 1. It could be anything any integer greater or equal to 1, and you can use different values of n to find out what different terms look like. And so they gave you that expression that had sn equals you know, 1 over n, etc., etc., and you can just plug any, any value you want into n. k is different. k is 
not a variable. K is an actual number. The reason they use the letter is because they didn't want to tell us what that number was. But it's an actual number. And we had, in this case, we didn't have to figure out what the number was because it was a yes-no question in an inequality type format, so we didn't need to find out exactly what k is. We just need to find out whether k is less than 9, uh, excuse me, greater than 9. But k is an actual number. It's a specific number, we just don't know what that number is. So when we use letters in algebra, there are two different ways. Just conceptually, there are different ways that we use letters. In one case, we use a letter just to be some uh, placeholder for an infinite number of different values that you could just plug in. You see that in functions, right? When they say if f of n equals n squared, n can take on any value. It's just to help define the function. It's a function that says you take the input and then you square it and you spit out the output. That's f of n equals n squared. And n can take on any value. And they'll even define the function. They'll say this function is defined for any values of n greater or equal to zero, for example. But uh, another situation in which we use letters in algebra is for situations where it's a specific number, we just don't know what that number is. And that's probably the more common one that we use in algebra. For example, if you see a question that asks, they'll tell you that a baseball bat and a baseball ball together cost a dollar and ten cents, and the bat costs one dollar more than the ball. How would you solve that? You'd probably use some algebra. You'd say x is the price of the ball, and then the uh, bat is x plus 1. And you'd say x plus x plus 1 equals 1.1. 1 .1, and then you'd solve for x. So there, x is an actual number. We just don't know what it is, but we're trying to find out. And we use x not as a variable, but as an unknown quantity that we're trying to find. Uh, so that's the difference there between k and n. n is a generic variable that could take on any positive integer, according to what they told us. And k is a specific number, we just don't know what that number is, so we're using k. If you found this video useful, go to quantreasoning.com for a lot more where that came from. You should also click that like button and let me know in the comments below what you'd like me to make future videos about. And of course, if you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and do that and click that bell below so you get notified about future videos. See you next time.